let's dig a little bit deeper into security. In this video, we're going to be covering pod security standards and pod security admission. They go hand in hand with one another, which is why we're covering them in this video together at the same time. So the standards are just a set of standards for pods and their security contacts or containers and their security contacts. And the admission is a way of applying them to all those pods and ensuring that all pods follow the rules of it. We do it at the namespace level. So all pods within a namespace will have standards applied. Well, not standards applied. You still have to write the security contacts for them, but it enforces or allows them to go through with audit logs or warnings displayed to the user, those standards. And the reason this is all important is because of two reasons, actually, because of security. Security is very important and should always be very important and should never go to the bottom of the list. It is the main reason people get hacked. They don't focus on security. They focus on minimum viable products and things like that. And, you know, it just, if you don't get security in, you're going to get hacked. And if you don't get hacked, you've been very lucky. That's pretty much all it comes down to. So security, 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 always security, make sure it's done. Ensure it is in there from the start. Security by design, that's what you need to do. Secondly, now I've kind of drilled that in, it's actually part of the exam. If you wanna go for the certified Kubernetes security specialist exam, then this will come into it at some point, or at least it will likely come into it at some point. So that's why it's important to know. Now, I feel like I've rambled on a little bit in this intro, so maybe we should just get into it. So before we get into a quick example, I'm just gonna run through a bit of the docs just so we can give you an overview of what's going on here. So pod security standards, there are three kinds. These are cumulative and range from highly permissive to highly restrictive, and they are privileged, baseline, and restricted. So we start with privileged. This is basically just as it is in the cluster by default. It's unrestricted. It provides the widest possible of permissions, and it's just, yeah, just allows for privilege escalations. The next one is baseline, which is minimally restrictive, meaning that if you were to run a default pod with no security context, then it would work. If you then started applying some security contacts in, then there would be certain rules you have to follow, which are detailed below. Restricted is heavily restricted. Even the basic deployments of a pod wouldn't work. It would expect you to set some defaults. So let's go through some of those and see what there is. I'm going to scroll past these bits because it pretty much explains what I've just said in a little bit more detail. But if you want to have a read of that, obviously go ahead. Now we have things like controls, we have restricted fields, and then the allowed values for those restricted fields, which are the policy. So for example, in this one, we have the control, which is host process and the policy. The policy is saying that if you set security context.windowsoptions.host process either at the pod level, the container level, init container, ephemeral containers, any of those things, if any of those have a security context of Windows options and host process, it must be set to false or just undefined. If you have a security context of host network, host PID, host IPC, then again, it must be set to false or undefined. And it's the same with all of these. You can see how all of them would be defined and what their values are. For example, take capabilities. If we look at this one, we looked at capabilities in the last video as part of the security context video, and we can add these particular ones. That's absolutely fine. We're allowed to do that. We'll see later on that this goes further down and we actually override that a little bit further by only allowing the net bind service when we talk about the restrictor policy. And I'm not going to read all of these out here because obviously you can you can read through these yourself to see what applies where. But you can see that we've got a bunch of different ones of restricted fields and allowed values for those fields. So as long as you're following these rules, you will meet the policy. You'll be absolutely fine. If we take a look at the restricted, like I say, it takes everything from the baseline profile and adds some additional stuff or overrides something. So if we take a look, at, for example, the capabilities here, we can see that we have to drop all capabilities and we are allowed to add the NetBind service. That is it. There's no other ones. The, you know, if, if we try and add one of the ones from up here, then it won't work. The only one that will is a NetBind service. So restrictive is restricting it even further for, for want of a better description of that. And that's pretty much all the standards are. They are a bunch of standards that are there to help secure your pods and containers to make sure you are following the best practices. So how do we apply these? Well, if we look at the pod security admission, which is part of the pod security admission controller, we have a way of enforcing them. So we have three levels and we just add labels to namespace and those labels will be a mode and a level. Your levels can be enforce, audit or warn. Enforce being that it will reject any pods that violate the policy. Audit will be that it will allow the pod 
but log it in the audit log. And one is that it will allow the pod, but it will display a on-screen prompt to the user saying, hey, look, you've violated these policies. In my opinion, we should all be running enforce on baseline and then audit and warn on restrictive so that people know that they can restrict these further to be even more secure. But the baseline should be the standard, in my opinion. Doesn't make me right, of course. There are going to be scenarios where the baseline is just a little bit too restrictive and it's down to the people to put security contacts in that match their requirements. But on a basic level, I would say everyone should be using baseline with enforce and then auditing and warning for restricted. Again, just my opinion. Anyway, little diversion there. Let's talk about how we implement it. And what we do is we add labels to a namespace, like say with modes and levels, the mode being enforce, audit or warn, and the level being privileged, baseline or restricted. So that's how we apply a standard. We then need to give it a version. So the version can be latest, but it should probably be the cluster version that you're running on. So it's usually the minor version, which would be 128 in our case. And again, what we do is we set the mode, so enforce, audit or warn, hyphen version equal to a version. And that's all it is. Now that might not make a lot of sense at the moment. And if it doesn't, we can click this link here, which takes us over to this page here that tells us how to implement them. I've just copied and pasted this into a YAML file. So I've just kind of pre-configured this ready for us. And I'm going to jump over to the IDE now and we'll take a look at it. So over on the IDE, we have that YAML file. And um, all that's happening here is that we are enforcing baseline with the version of 128. We could have this as latest if we wanted to. We are auditing, so audit logging, but allowing restricted profile. So anything that violates the restricted policy will be allowed, but we'll log it in the audit log. And then anything that violates restricted policy will be warned to the user on screen. All of them using version 1.28 because that's the cluster version we're on and it just makes sense to keep it with the version we're working with. And for this, I'm creating a new namespace called security hyphen learning. So how does this work? What can we do to test this out and make sure it works? Well, firstly, let's apply the namespace. So I'll do QTTL, apply hyphen F, and then we will do workload. And then we're in a new folder called security here. And it's NS hyphen security. I also have web and CM. These are direct copies from CM and web in here. Nothing's changed. The only thing that has is that I'm targeting the new namespace. That's it. There's no security contacts or anything like that on any of these containers or the pod itself. So let's apply that and see what happens first. We'll do kubectl, apply hyphen F, and I'll do workload security. So we're, we're applying the config map and the web resource here, as well as everything in the namespace again, which won't change. And there we go, straight away, we've got a warning. So this will have been logged in the audit log too. And what it's saying is, look, you're gonna violate the pod security standard of restricted version 128. And these are the violations of that. It doesn't violate any baseline ones because baseline is like, say, if I just run that as just baseline, it will get deployed. And the evidence of that is if we get the pod, you can see all of those pods are running because it meets the baseline standards, but it just makes sure that we're not doing stuff we shouldn't be doing. So for example, let's, in fact, let's just have a look at one of those policies again. If I jump back up to baseline and look at something that we are not allowed to do. So privileged containers, let's do that. So I'm just gonna run, uh, let's have a look. We will go security context and we'll do privileged and we'll set that to true. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and delete that deployment now. So if I just go for delete and then we'll do web and then I'll reapply it. Remember, we want the baseline standards and the baseline will not allow us to run it as privileged. So I'll apply that, do kubectl, get pod. I'll reverse search for the get pods, but let's just have a quick look at this. So would violate pod security restricted and we've got this privilege true. Nginx must not set this to true. Now this is saying it's the restricted one, but it also applies to the baseline, which we've just seen. So let's get the pod and have a look. And we can see there's no pods in the namespace at all. The reason being, because it's not allowed to deploy. Like I say, this only applies to the pod level, not the deployment or the replica set. So if I do kubectl, get deploy and RS, we'll see that we've got them. There's desired three, but current none. So let's take a look at the replica set. And we'll do kubectl. Describe RS, replica set, namespace, security learning, and see what happens there. And straight away, bang, there it is, look. It's violating pod security. So great, that's violating the baseline one. It's not allowed to deploy. The deployment and the replica set's there, but we're not allowed to deploy it because it violates it. So we're gonna delete that, that's fine. Let's go look at some of the other ones to make sure that we're not violating anything else as well. Well, we know we're not, they're all restricted and they're only warning us and putting audits out. But as a good engineer, I wanna make sure that these are as secure as I can make them. Okay, so let's have a look at what we've got here. We've got a container of Nginx set to privilege true. Well, we've just removed that, so we're okay there. We've also got this allow privilege escalation not equal to false. So if we have a look, we've got containers Nginx and Nginx Prometheus. So that's this one and this one. And they must set the security context dot allow privilege escalation to false. Well, that's simple. We can do that. So we can do allow privilege escalation to false. 
I can copy that and drop that into here. Now it's worth noting here that it says containers, not pods. We can only set this one at the container level. Let's look at the next one. We have unrestricted capabilities, again at the container level, which is capabilities.drop equals all. Well, let's do that. We can do capabilities, we can do drop and all. We'll drop that into here as well for the Nginx container. So that's the Nginx and Nginx Prometheus containers covered. And then we've got this runners non root not equal to true. Now this is pod or containers. Well, let's set that at the pod level then. So we'll do security context. We'll do run as non root and set that to true. So that will cover that one. So that's the Nginx and Nginx Prometheus containers covered because we've done it at the pod level. And then finally, we've got this setcom profile. Now I've not covered this before. Don't worry too much about it for now. We will cover it more in a later video, but we'll set this to runtime default. So we need set comp profile dot type at the pod or container level. So we'll do it up here and then type equals run time default. And that should get rid of all of the warnings. So we'll go ahead now and apply that. So let's do that and brilliant. There we go. So I'm just going to make sure that's everything up to date. No warnings. Everything's great. We can go home, go back to bed, do whatever we want to do. It's absolutely fine, right? Not necessarily. Let's take a look at those pods. Problem is, Nginx loves running as root, and there's not really a lot we can do about that. And if we take a look at this, we'll do QCTL, describe pod in the namespace security learning. And there's an error. Container has run as non-root and image will run as root. That's just the way the Nginx container is released. But they do provide an unprivileged container to get around it if you want to. But that exists. That's there. So, you know, make of that what you will. Anyway, so how can we fix this? Well, we can just run as non-root for the Nginx Prometheus one, right? And that's, that's fine. So we can just take that delete it out of the pod level, drop it into the security context for the container, Nginx Prometheus, reapply it. And then we have this error come back up, but we as the administrators go, yep, yeah, we know why that is. It's fine. We're allowing that through. It's only a warning. It's getting logged in the audit logs, but we're allowing it through. It's fine. So let's take a look at our pod again. Oh no, now we have another error. What could this be? Well, this is a crash loop back off. So we're going to check the logs for this one. I mean, we could describe it, you know, but we're not going to get anything from it. So there we go. It's just backing off for some reason or another. So let's go ahead and take a look at why that might be. So we'll do logs hyphen F and let's take a look. Ah, operation not permitted. Hmm. It's trying to chone something here. Wow. I know for a fact that that would be this capability causing that problem. So we're dropping all, but we need to allow or add chone, which is one of the permissions allowed at the baseline level. If we go back and take a look at some of the capabilities, we can see here we've got chone. So that should fix that. But at the restricted level, we're not allowed chone. So we need to make a decision here. Do we want to run this as a root container with the privilege added? You know, if I apply that, we're going to get the capabilities. We must not include Joan. Okay. And if we get our pods, has that fixed the problem? Well, yeah, it has. They're running now as non-root and they've got Joan. But we don't really want that, do we? We want to be best practices as much as we can. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that and I'll take this and put it back at the pod level and reapply it. Problem with this is it's just not going to work, is it? Because, you know, if we look, it's yeah, okay, that's fine. But it's we already know that's not going to work because it wants to run as root and it wants to have chone. So how do we get around that? Thankfully, this is where Nginx have done something good for us. And if we could look at Nginx Inc forward slash Nginx hyphen unprivileged, this is a container they've created, which runs as unprivileged. I think it runs on port 8080 by default, so we could change that. But we're already using port 8080 on this pod or it's listed on port 8080. Yeah, okay, so we can change this to 8081, for example. Again, at the service level, we can route through port 80 through to 8081. It's not a problem. But now we can drop those capabilities. We can run on an unprivileged port, which means thumbs up. Everything's good, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. So we've not got any warnings. And if I get my pod, that's everything up and running. So now we've got Nginx running. Unprivileged, not running as root. Excellent. That's, that's happy days. <laughs> Now, this isn't going to be an option with every container you come across, that every image that you come across, you might have to build your own, in which case, build your own. Not a problem. But in some cases, they've thought about this and they've put this out ready for you. So this is provided by Nginx. But yeah, that's that's basically it. You know, that's, that's how we can restrict things. That's how we can make things work for us based on the restricted and baseline profiles. The more secure, the better, right? That's the way you've got to look at this. So that's where we'll leave it. And that's it. That's everything you need to know about the pod security standards and the admission controller. And that is pretty much everything other than reading through the standards themselves and ensuring you're following the rules of them or just getting warnings out and following what it says there, as I showed you. That's pretty much it. 
So in the next video, we're going to talk about App Armor and how that can be used in Kubernetes. I'm not going to touch on SE Linux. I've decided it's if you're using SE Linux, then you should know how SE Linux labeling applies and you can extrapolate that into security context and SE Linux within it. I don't have a cluster running SE Linux and I wasn't going to set one up anytime soon. Maybe at some point in the future I will. But to be honest, you can extrapolate what we've learned about security context. And if you know enough about SE Linux labeling, then you can apply that. SE Linux isn't a Kubernetes thing. It's a Linux thing, specifically Red Hat implementations, if I remember rightly. It's been a while. And yeah, that's that's something you can extrapolate. But we're going to talk about AppArm in the next one. So that's what we're going to focus on. And then after that, I think I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight videos left trying to make it till the end of the year at least for this series so we'll see we've got termination handlers and messengers we've got probes we've got admission controllers which i want to touch on i'm not going to be writing one i'm just going to show you how they work how they can block things uh oidc auth which is something i want to touch on because that is a good way of having users come into the cluster i did one a while back on well, a few videos back on how to set up users and groups i want to extrapolate that into the oidc auth now then we're going to talk about gateway api that's just going to be a chatty video more than anything might do a few examples it's still in development so it's a bit hard to do a full video on it at the moment and to be honest i've not played with it that much yet i've only had a little bit of exposure to it so i need to come up with some content for that video then we'll have a look at things like monitoring the cluster with prometheus and displaying metrics in graphs with grafana and maybe we'll talk about cluster api and things like maybe even service meshes i might do one on istio at some point but I feel like that might be a series of its own, so I'm still deciding on whether to do that. And then that is the end of my list. I wrote this at the start of the year, and I'm kind of at the bottom of it. So it's a case of then coming up with some stuff like how we go about CICD in a cluster. You know, maybe we talk about Argo, Flux, things like that, but that's going to be a separate series. So we're, we're coming to the back end of this Kubernetes series now, I think. I might come up with other ideas. We'll see. But so far, I feel like we're starting to hit that point where I might make it till the end of the year and then come up with a new series, so we'll see. Anyway, I'm rambling on a bit about stuff that I don't need to ramble on in the end of this video, so I'm going to stop, and I'll see you in the next one.